So it's, uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce the first speaker of this session, Vishwat Dixit. Uh, Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I guess I can hear myself. All right. Thank you, Morton. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you uh, to the or organizers, Morton et al., for putting together this really fantastic meeting. And it's my first time in Copenhagen, and it is really fantastic also because my father studied here. So, uh, so it's amazing to be in a city and to come and give a talk in a university where, you know, where he was. So, um, so I thought that uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll, uh, I'll kind of give you an uh, overall uh, introduction about uh, some of the work that has been going on in my lab since, since actually since 2007 um, that we have now begun to publish uh, on the human caloric restriction study called uh, the Calorie, which was uh, funded by the National Institute on Aging. So <clears throat> I don't want to belabor this point. This has been made pretty well by Felipe Sierra early in the morning, uh, or yesterday, I guess, um, about the hallmarks. And I think um, uh, there are a couple uh, things which are pretty clear, which have been mentioned before, is that increase of inflammation with age and the metabolic dysfunction are really important parts of the process of aging, not just as some sort of a biomarker of aging, but in fact causally and mechanistically related to it. And uh, Christina Kamel, a former uh, colleague and a postdoc in my lab now, uh, who is a faculty in the University of Minnesota, showed uh, a few years ago that, that in fact these two processes are interlinked in a way that it causes dysfunction of the fat cells, adipocytes, and that's gonna be one of the themes of my uh, presentation. And what Christina found was that in fact, with age, the ability of the adipocytes to release substrates like fatty acids get, re get reduced because of inflammation-induced breakdown of these neurotransmitters called as catecholamines. So the question really is um, um, the visceral adiposity and increased inflammation why are they uh, important in aging? Are they interlinked? And uh, this is, um, uh, I think, something which is known uh, to clinicians, geriatricians in the field for a very long time, that uh, with aging, what happens is you get increased um, visceral adiposity. And this happens despite the fact if you maintain your normal body mass index. So this is a representative individual on, on the left, 31 years old, that uh, has the same BMI as the one on the right, 74 years old. And you can see that this causes an increase, this, there's an increase in visceral adiposity. This has been shown, obviously, to be highly associated with uh, 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 several adverse outcomes in, in aging. We are quite interested in, in the visceral adipose tissue for multiple reasons, because um, we are trying to study and understand the process of inflammation and the origin of inflammation in aging. So what you're looking at here uh, is, is actually a, a whole mount confocal microscope image of uh, adipose tissue. It doesn't project very well because the sun's shining on it. And um, what you're looking at is all the green that you see are the myeloid cells. So they are, in this case, they are primarily macrophages that are indelibly marked with membrane GFP. So, and you would wonder, damn, that's like a lot of macrophages. This looks like a really bad place. No, in fact, this is a healthy adipose tissue. So uh, macrophages are normal residents of the uh, adipose tissue, which have really critical function that we probably don't know much in detail as to what they're doing. And what we're trying to understand is this crosstalk that happens in these metabolic organs that lead to this potentially increased inflammation, whether these cells have something to do with it. And um, what are these interactions? So we have shown this in past almost now a decade ago uh, uh, in this paper, which was published by my colleague uh, Yuni Yom, um, showing that the inflammaging, uh, this term that was coined by Claudia Franceschi, is in fact really important for uh, uh, the, the, the process of aging at least health span. I don't have re really a lot of time. This is already uh, published, but key thing here is to remind you that there are indeed mechanisms that control the process of inflammation that can be targeted. And there's a quite a bit of interest in targeting this, this, this multi-protein uh, sensor, a multi-molecular uh, 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 platform, uh, uh, a pattern recognition receptor sensor that's present in the macrophages called as the NLRP3 inflammasome, which was first discovered by Jörg Chopp in, in Switzerland. The key thing about the NLRP3 inflammasome is that with age, it can sense all these damage-associated molecular patterns that are listed right up here. Okay? It's very promiscuous. 
And what it does is that when it gets activated or persistently activated, it cleaves these two uh, major pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-18, and releases them into circulation. So what we showed was that if we go upstream and target NLRP3, at least genetically, um, we could see that the tissue resident macrophages were uh, less inflamed, and these animals were protected from all these uh, age-related processes that are, that are shown here. So, so these animals are protected from bone loss because they have less osteoclast activity, they have improved insulin tolerance because of uh, uh, reduced macrophage activation in the adipose tissue, um, and so on and so forth. You can read the rest of the things. These animals are in general pretty good shape. And so the question really comes is, um, uh, so the NLRP3 inflammasome is obviously a really critical uh, 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 you know, a sensor and is being studied and targeted. Uh, several companies are working on it, uh, and hopefully aging is uh, going to be part of that uh, 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 scene. But <clears throat> now that we know some of these basic mechanisms that are impacting uh, inflammation, the question is, can we, can we actually target them, and, and in fact, there are, if there are any immunometabolic so-called checkpoints, and if they are, whether they are going to be relevant. So the approach that we took, something that I have been really interested in for a very long time, is what is the impact of negative energy balance on the host? Okay? And this is typically would happen if one uh, is in a calorie-restricted state. We know this, you know, from, I don't have to belabor this point, but the key thing that we know for a long time is that when, you, when the host is in this negative energy balance state, you have these bunch of changes that occur here. There is apparently reduced immune response. There's definitely reduced inflammation. Um, but there is maintenance of homeostasis somehow and longevity. Um, and we think that for this to happen, you have to have an integrated immunometabolic response. Um, and there are multiple components of that. I don't have the time. The problem with the negative energy balance uh, uh, in rodents uh, is, is that the longevity that, that happens comes with trade-offs. And I think some of those are listed here. Uh, so somatopause, growth, uh, 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 growth uh, stasis, reproductive stasis, you know, these animals are more prone to infection. So the question is, what can we do to really study um, a negative energy balance in a, uh, in a context that's relevant to human biology or human physiology? And, um, and this was a huge effort uh, that uh, was put together uh, by this consortia called as the CALORIE, uh, which is an acronym for uh, Comprehensive Assessment of Long-Term Effects of Reducing Intake of Energy. It's a long word. Um, so this is a fantastic trial, the only uh, randomized controlled trial to date, which is very well controlled, uh, that was able to prescribe amount of calorie restriction that was carried on for two years' time. So basically the idea was, <clears throat> You know, uh, unlike rodents that uh, uh, have lots of issues in the laboratory condition, let's see whether CR is relevant to, to, to human physiology because, you know, the, the, the typical argument is that, oh, you know, this you know, CR in rodents, you're just studying, you know, your control animals are too fat and, you know, CR animals are just healthy, so CR is just really nothing. So, um, so therefore, this study was done in people, in healthy people that are not obese, and the prescription was that, you know, we'll try to see if they reduce their calorie intake by 25%. This trial was done at three sites. Uh, uh, Pennington, my former institution that I was very lucky to be involved in in this, in this study, uh, WashU and, and Tufts with a uh, coordinating center at, uh, at the Duke. Um, and this was basically the idea uh, to study. So um, my colleagues, Leanne Redman and, and Eric Ravison, has now published these data. So the two key points here, okay? So if you look at the graph on the left, uh, I don't want to get into the details as to how this was all done. You can read about this. Uh, the point is that it's very rigorous. Uh, the first thing is that people in free living condition uh, can actually only undergo about 15% calorie restriction. Okay? So even though NIA wanted 25%, they actually cannot do 25% in a free living condition. Okay? And, but this, this uh, amount of calorie reduction is actually quite quite, quite uh, potent in the sense of uh, reduction of body weight. So people lose body weight uh, between month six until two years, and then their weight stable. So that's a period when many people think that, okay, we are actually studying real effects of calorie restriction rather than just, you know, acute weight loss. So this was what done. Now the question is, what are we going to study in healthy people? That is going to tell us that CR is relevant to aging biology. Remember, these are not old people. They are 25 to 48 year old people. And Therefore, you guys should study the immune system because there's a lot to be learned there. 
So what you're looking at is um, uh, the uh, chemical shift MRI image of a uh, human thymus on the left and a 25-year-old healthy person, you know, a graduate student, by the time you're tenured and professor, your thymus is short. So the uh, basic point of this slide is just to, just to remind you, for those of you, uh, that the aging of thymus precedes aging of other organs. Okay? We had this discussion as to what are we going to study that tells us at the age of 30 that we are already, you know, in bad shape. Well, here's an example. So you can see that when you do this MRI, there is um, this intrathymic fat that's visible right here. If you saturate the signal that's coming from water, you can see the functional thymus, the functional volume right here. But by age of 45, the major component, the major constituent of thymus actually is, are not T cells or the stroma, it's actually fat. Okay? And, uh, and that happens in multiple places. And from the fat sat signal, you can see this is gone. So we decided that we, this is one of the places that we're going to look at. The data in the rodents had been up and down with the CR. Um, we had our own data that suggested that the intrathymic fat in the rodents was less. But there had also been data by my colleagues that suggesting that if you do CR in mice, it's probably going to be worse. And it was the case in some cases. So, you know, the study was done and, uh, and unblinded. Uh, and then when the data was unblinded and, and everything, some things came out that were quite remarkable and totally unexpected. Which was, uh, as pretty obvious from this, from this slide, is that, so this is a fat sat image again of, uh, of a healthy person, a representative healthy person. Um, uh, this is the thymus is present just above the ascending aorta. And so you can see this is the same individual that came in at baseline and two years after calorie restriction. We were actually stunned to see that the functional thymic mass in these people was actually higher. And this is predominantly because of mobilization of the ectopic fat that's present in the thymus. This is pretty unprecedented because um, uh, there has been um, very little evidence of this happening in, in humans. Uh, immunologists have tried to study it for a long period of time. There have been a few studies here and there with growth hormone. Uh, that, that, that show something, but uh, uh, I think um, this is one of the examples that in fact there are, there are organs uh, that are degenerating that in fact can be rejuvenated by very simple interventions in this case. Caloric restriction. I mean, we've been studying it for 50 years and we have now data from humans. So the question is, um, if it is, uh, you know, if thymus is bigger, it may not be better. So uh, one can quantitate the amount of new T cells that are being made in the thymus through this marker called a signal joint trex. I don't want to go into details, it's not perfect. The point being that individuals that had increased in thymic mass, you, you will notice that we don't have as many subjects because a lot of people, you know, did not want to go into the uh, MRI and there was motion artifacts and all those things. But the key point here is that these new recent thymic emigrants that are being made in, from, from the thymus are actually higher. And this, in fact, is a, is a pretty good, I would say, biomarker of, of aging, because if you would do uh, the analysis, and I think there was a study out of Stanford by Saeed et al. in Nature, Nature Aging, I believe, very, very solid study, where they showed that, in fact, reduction of naive T cells is one of the strongest predictors of, uh, of, of subsequent disease. And this is something that can be easily measured. I mean, it's not something rocket science. So there are things that... And, and here is an intervention that shows that this is modifiable. So it kind of gives us something. So <clears throat> now the question is what is actually happening uh, in terms of the mechanisms of caloric restriction in people? Uh, we were grateful and fortunate to get these adipose tissue biopsies from individuals that came in at baseline at one year and at two years. Uh, you can clearly see that the uh, transcriptome of these individuals is very different from the baseline to year two. Uh, and <laughs> I recall Max Ardemov, who is uh, our fantastic collaborator at WashU, he says, you know, these are amazing inbred mice. We did not tell him what the data was. And he says, no, actually, these are people. And it was stunning. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, I mean, really think about it. I mean, for us, people like me who have studied mice all my life, to see these type of data in people with this clarity was really, really fantastic and amazing. So what we decided was, <clears throat> okay, um, let's see what, what we find from here, but I just uh, have a quick slide here that I, I added this just for Joe Takahashi, which is uh, to show what the, the immunometabolic pathways that are up and down. There are a few key points I want to make here. One, that what we have found in model organisms is actually very relevant to human physiology. So many of these pathways that have shown up here are also have previously been described right, the way, right away from worms all the way uh, to, to monkeys. Uh, some are unique. 
um, uh, our top pathway was this. I think maybe Joe will talk about it in the next couple of days. Um, but the, the key point of this was that uh, <clears throat> there was substantial increase in fatty acid oxidation. Of course, you would expect that. But there was also a substantial reduction in inflammation. And what we wanted to do was, in this case, fairly simple, an idea that was put forth by my colleagues, Don Ingram, and while uh, Rafa and I, we were postdocs at the NIA, was, you know, this idea was about calorie restriction by medics. So if we get this type of a strong biological response in humans, now, can we harness those things from people and then reverse translate it into, you know, worms or flies or mice? Uh, why go from worm, in this case, to, to human when there is something happening right here? Clearly. So <clears throat> this is exactly what we did. I'm not going to show you the data. I know we go to lots of meetings. By the end of the meeting or after a few weeks, we re remember nothing. <laughs> At least I don't. I forget a lot, so I take notes. So p first thing is that um, remember this molecule, PLA2G7. This is published. This is one of the checkpoints that is inhibited by calorie restriction. And I think Ross Anderson described it here quite nicely. So this is one of those um, uh, molecules that is inhibited by CR and um, can impact multiple pathways that inhibit uh, uh, the process of, uh, of aging and, and disease. So I will end by showing you that, uh, or, or to try to convince you, now that these data are coming out, that this is actually an incredible resource and a platform for, for our community. Because what Calorie has done for us in this case is allowed us to actually pursue these studies rigorously over the last 15 years or so, and have them out so that you know, we can all of you can, you know, find things that are relevant and, and you know, pursue them. So, <clears throat> so we are using this uh, over the past several years to identify targets and, and see what we can find. And, and our goal really is to see what we find that, that, that allows the immune and metabolic systems to talk to each other. So the target that we have found is a protein called a SPARC, uh, one of the top genes here, uh, which is really interesting, interesting protein. It's, a, it's almost exclusively made by the fat cells, adipocytes, and, and the structure is, is, is right up here. It's called secreted protein, acidic, and rich in cysteine. Um, so uh, it's a matricellular protein, so it binds to extracellular matrix. It's very promiscuous in terms of its action, binds to multiple receptors. And we were able to show uh, uh, that it's the acidic domain of this protein that's critical. This paper is just out, uh, I think coming tomorrow, I guess. Um, so I'm just going to summarize rather than kind of overwhelm you with this because this is actually online. And I would rather have some discussion, hopefully. Um, so <clears throat> Spark is another molecule that was harnessed from this human uh, study that is telling us uh, a lot about how energy balance and immune system is linked. So the key point here, Spark is made by the adipocytes, okay? It's, by the way, it's, its expression in the adipocytes is four times higher than leptin, right? It's really, really highly expressed. So what, um, uh, the Spark, what Spark does is it's made from the adipocytes. It acts on, on, on macrophages, tissue resident macrophages. And what it turns out, it, what it does is it actually ligates TLR4, which was really surprising. And, and once it ligates TLR4, TLR4, it activates two arms of inflammation. One is uh, the arm that goes down the TRIF pathway that would activate interferon response, which we heard about today, how important that is for aging. And the other is with, via the adapter MyD88 to increase pro-inflammatory cytokines. Key point for those of you who are physiologists is that weight loss, caloric restriction, protein restriction, would uh, reduce the amount of spark. Uh, obesity, high fat diet increases the amount of spark. This has, we have shown it and there are data out there. And what this increased spark is doing is activating these macrophages to produce more inflammation and higher uh, uh, over exuberant uh, or exuberant interferon response. And, uh, and if you lower that, uh, CR lowers it, uh, but we can genetically lower it. Uh, so I'll end, just, just a few key points. First and foremost, I think uh, for those of you who uh, have been debating whether CR works or does not work, I think calorie 2 has put that debate to rest, at least in my view. Not about longevity. It works. It works in terms of its mechanism. Uh, several, think, several conserved mechanisms are up or down regulated that have previously been shown to be involved in longevity. Uh, it is... Really important to know that actually in, in this case, in people, it re reduces inflammation, improves health span, and all those things. Other key point is that, you know, you, all you have to do is restrict calories. You don't have to, in this case, time your meals or whatever if you can do it. 
great. I, I'm not a proponent of that. Um, but what I think important point is that few proteins that emerge from this spark is one of them, PLA2G7 is another. If you call me next time, I can tell you about a few more. Um, but I will end uh, by, uh, by, I think, just making a plug that uh, please look at these data sets. Uh, and I think they are very rich and important. Most important slide, really. Um, uh, this is, was a huge effort, actually. I started it when I started my lab in 2007 in Pennington. So, uh, and that is Calorie, the team of Calorie, and the team science that NIH was able to put together, get people from across the fields, immunologists, metabol metabolism people, diabetes people, and you know, we could get this study done. Um, and so I've acknowledged the people that have done the work. Two important people who worked on this project was uh, my former colleagues, Olga Spadaro, who is now a scientist at AstraZeneca, and Yuni Yom, who is an associate research scientist in the lab, um, and uh, several of my colleagues listed here. Max Ardemov uh, uh, is an old friend and colleague who, who helps us a lot with bioinformatics. Thank you. Happy to answer any question. I hope I did not go too much over time. Thank you so much, Vikrant. Uh, uh, you want me to stay? Yeah, yeah, please oh. stay, please stay. We have time for one question, I think. Hi, great talk. So I had a question regarding the time, thymic involution data, what you showed. So I, I, I'm not sure like how was the age distribution of the, of the people who have you included in the clean air trial. And did you see any difference in the degree of, th I mean, the thymic involution you saw when you have a patient, I mean, person who's like 45 years old compared to the person who's 30 years old. So if you see, see, saw similar results in the Right, lab. right. So this was a proof of, this was a proof of concept uh, uh, study. It was not powered uh, because we did not design the trial to study this. And so, but there are subsequent studies now that are being planned. And uh, hopefully we can have a lot more numbers in, in this case to be able to evaluate. Uh, the individuals are between 25 and 48. Uh, you would notice that there were certain individuals that did not respond. Okay, most of those individuals are at the later half of the age. Um, and uh, we didn't have enough numbers also to kind of really see the difference between males and females, which I think is really, really important. Uh, as far as you know, immunometabolic responses is concerned. So I think a lot needs to be done. But what that's uh, telling us is that you know, these interventions and, and uh, the places like thymus, which are critical for production of T cells and you know, responsible for aging, there's a lot to be learned in this case with our interventions as we move forward. All right, thank you so much, Richard, and the <laughs> fascinating talk. Would you go this down here? And uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Dudley Lemming, um, who will probably tell us something about uh, amino acids, I'm guessing. Whenever you're ready. We good? Okay. All right, so um, we've already talked about how you shouldn't be eating too much, um, but what should we be eating? So people have for many years thought about how we could modify our diet without restricting calories to improve health. And it started originally thinking about fat many years ago, that we should be eating certain types of fat um, to prevent cardiovascular disease. More recently, there's been a, a concentration on carbohydrates as a source of, that drives the obesity epidemic. But I'm going to tell you about protein. So many of you are probably familiar with the idea that dietary protein is good for you. It promotes satiety. It crowds out calories from other sources, helps you build muscle when you exercise. But most people um, in the population that um, we're con most concerned about um, tends to be towards the overweight side and rather sedentary. And in that context, epidemiological studies generally suggest that protein consumption is actually bad. A number of studies uh, include one by Maureen Levine and Walter Longo looking at retrospective analysis of NHANES data. Um, more recently, a 10-year study um, following people prospectively in Europe found that diabetes risk doubled um, as you went from the lowest quartile protein consumption to the highest. And a number of other studies over the years have also looked at negative effects of high-protein diets and the cardiovascular system. 
So summing up a large number of studies um, conducted by our lab um, in collaboration with Luigi Fontana and many studies by other investigators, basically speaking, dietary protein restriction has beneficial effects in both humans and mice. Um, these effects include that um, animals, including people, on a protein-restricted diet tend to lose weight, they tend to have reduced adiposity, and their improvements in glucose homeostasis. So why do we study diets in mice? So obviously mice are not furry little people. Um, there are trade-offs to be considered in using a model organism. But fundamentally, dietary studies in mice let us do a lot of things that we can't do in people. So they eat exactly what we feed them, so there's no worries about whether they're adhering to the diet or not. We can measure exactly how much they eat, and we can control diet composition precisely. So any of the couple of randomized control trials of protein restrictions in humans are inevitably uh, confounded by the fact that instead of just eating less protein, they're also eating different types of protein sources. Less hamburgers and steak, more fish, legumes, various oils. So obviously um, that confounds those issues. And of course we can do a lot more tests. So what's actually altered in a low protein diet that regulates metabolic health? So we, our lab for many years now has been concentrating on the composition of dietary protein and specifically the role of individual amino acids in the response to dietary protein restriction. Any low protein diet inevitably will have decreased levels of each of the amino acids as well in particular the nine essential amino acids. We've concentrated primarily on the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, um, but I'll touch briefly on the role of some of the other amino acids at the end of the talk. Branch chain amino acids have been found to be really important in metabolic health for a long period of time. In the late 1960s, it was shown that they're elevated in the blood of people who are insulin resistant. And more recently, um, over the last couple of decades, have been shown to be elevated in both humans with diabetes as well as animal models of diabetes and obesity. Dietary levels of branched amino acids correlate very well with glycated hemoglobin, so they can sort of be used as predictor of type 2 diabetes. And interestingly, a number of interventions that lower, um, uh, that lower branched amino acids are associated with improved metabolic health. So here is data from the protein restriction trial we did with Luigi Fontana's laboratory. And we saw that branched amino acid levels in the blood specifically went down by about 10% on average, while the levels of other amino acids, such as methionine, were unchanged. So um, we've been studying for a while what happens when you can restrict dietary branched chain amino acids. And a number of beneficial things happen. Um, this is a study that we published last year um, looking at lifelong branched chain amino acid restriction. You can see that bo for both um, females on the left and males on the right, um, mice fed a low branched chain amino acid diet way less. These animals are not calorie restricted. In fact, throughout most of their lifespan, they eat more calories, so they actually have, they're eating more calories, yet they're remaining of lower weight. Um, and overall, this is, does affect both adipose mass and lean mass, but we've done many different studies to conclude that this type of restriction um, does not increase um, adiposity. Um, overall, the animals remain leaner and they remain still able to perform well on road rod and grip strength assays, so this is not negatively impacting muscle health. Overall, animals on a low branch amino acid diet have improved glucose tolerance, so reduced area under the curve during a glucose tolerance test, um, and this again occurs throughout life. We looked at frailty in the animals using Susan Howlett and Kenneth Rockwood's clinical frailty index for mice. Um, here, we're tracking what happens to frailty over age. And you can see that in male mice, um, while we get a normal age-associated increase in frailty, um, in control-fed animals, low-branch amino acid-fed animals um, don't have that response. And this is sex-specific, so we only see the improvements in frailty um, in the male mice and not the females. Overall, this correlates very well with what we see in terms of longevity. Um, we find that there's a significant uh, increase in median as well as maximal lifespan in mice fed a low branch amino acid diet. It's very similar to the lifespan extension found 
by a low protein restricted diet. In both cases, the level of restriction that we're talking about here is 67%. Um, so we reduce it by two thirds from the level found in a control diet. And while it's difficult to make comparisons to humans, most humans who are eating a relatively um, standard American diet are probably eating about four times the RDA of branched chain amino acids. So this type of restriction is probably relevant um, for translation to humans as well. One thing that's very interesting though is we don't see lifespan extension in the females. And our work fits in a general paradigm overall, so work by Steve Simpson, Samantha Sol, and Beignet, looking at later life introduction on restriction of branched amino acids, found that as you increase the amount of branched amino acids in the diet of mice, they have a shorter lifespan. Um, so more branched amino acids overall seem to have negative effects. So one of the questions is why? And so we decided to focus on skeletal muscle due to the frailty phenotypes in our animals. And when we looked at male and female mice um, placed on low branch amino acid diets, we saw a lot of genes change in both, but about twice as many genes change in male animals on a low BC8 diet as females. And if we look at a principal component analysis plot, you can see the controls overlap here, and then they're sort of pulled in different directions, um, female mice or male mice. So what does that look like in terms of pathways that are changing? Um, so one thing that's really interesting is b the diets in both sexes uh, change lots of pathways, um, but the pathways changed in males and females don't overlap. Um, and you can see there's actually zero overlap here. Now, this is only correlative, so we can't prove that this is the way what's um, extending their lifespan, but we did notice that there was a change in the mTOR signaling pathway. And actually, this was specific to the males, and there's actually an upregulation of genes here. But if you look at what genes are being upregulated, we saw that actually what's upregulated is several inhibitors of mTOR signaling. And we saw this at the Western blot level as well. So if we look at the phosphorylation of mTOR substrates, we see that there's decreased phosphorylation of S6 as well as S6K in the muscle as well as some other tissues of low branch amino acid fed males, but not in females. So in males, we get BCAA restriction, inhibits mTOR signaling in males, reduces frailty in males, extends lifespan in males. So we're really interested in trying to understand which of the branch chain amino acids regulate these effects and why. And so we've dived into looking at the individual amino branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, restricting them in the diets of mice and seeing what would happen. Now, our prediction might be that leucine would be very important. Leucine is the most abundant of the branched chain amino acids. It's the best mTOR agonist. Um, but that's not actually what we see. We actually see that isoleucine is a key molecule here. So when we restrict dietary isoleucine, we get a vast improvement in glucose tolerance. This is the red line here, the lowest area under the curve during a glucose tolerance test. Um, even better than restricting all three branched chain amino acids together. And this seems to be true across the board. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go through everything, but as a sort of a summary of, of metabolic phenotypes, you can see that a low leucine diet um, and a control diet have very similar metabolic phenotypes. Actually, if anything, leucine restriction makes you a little fatter if you're a black six mouse. Um, whereas restricting isoleucine to a lesser extent, valine and branched chain amino acids all improve metabolic health. And these are not only sufficient to induce metabolic be benefits, but they're actually required, or isoleucine is required, to achieve the metabolic benefits of a low protein diet. So what happens when we restrict it in these animals? So we placed um, HET3 mice, the same mice used by the interventions testing program, on control and low isoleucine diet starting at six months of age. So not as young as some of our previous work. And we tracked what happened to frailty over time. Um, overall, these mice have improved glucose tolerance, reduced adiposity, as we talked about for um, branched amino acid restricted mice. And in males, and um, maybe a little bit in females, there's also an effect on frailty. So again, they have less frailty as they age, despite the fact that we're restricting a branched chain amino acid. Um, and there's a very profound um, effect on longevity, particularly in the males. There's over a 30% extension of median lifespan. Um, you can see maximum is increased as well. And there's also a smaller effect on female lifespan, so about a 7% increase there. 
Finally, of course, everyone's really interested in the, if these type of results apply to humans. Um, working with epidemiologists at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, we looked at what happens in dietary levels of protein and how those are associated with metabolic health. For isoleucine, but not the other branch chain amino acids, there's an association um, between BMI and the amount of isoleucine in your diet. Um, th these type of graphs are a little bit hard for um, non-epidemiologists to read. So basically, if you go from 4% to 5% of your diet being isoleucine, you would predict that your BMI would go up by about 2.5. So about 5 to 10% of your average person's BMI. And isoleucine has been identified as well as a potential um, uh, predictor of mortality. So a study in Nature Communications in 2019 2019 using machine learning to try and adjust, identify um, blood markers of mortality found that elevated levels of isoleucine in your blood, but not the other branched amino acids are associated with increased mortality. So concluding, overall decreasing protein and branched amino acids um, improves metabolic health, and at least in males, it improves um, longevity as well as reducing frailty. A low branch amino acid diet reduces mTORC1 signaling selectively in male, but not female mice. And trying to figure out why that is is something we're very interested in. And when we restrict just isoleucine um, by about two thirds, we can improve metabolic health, reduce frailty, and extend lifespan. And once again, there's no calorie restriction in isoleucine restricted mice. If anything, their calorie restriction, uh, calorie consumption is higher than control fed animals. And at least um, from an association standpoint, isoleucine seems to associate um, with increased BMI and increased mortality in humans. Of course, it remains to be determined if those are causative. Just to conclude briefly about all of our amino acids, I think one thing that's quite interesting is that we're achieving a lot of information. Um, it's well established that methionine restriction in increases lifespan. And now we've shown that isoleucine restriction um, can increase lifespan as well. Um, and both of these are associated with improved metabolic health when we restrict these amino acids. Um, there's less profound evidence that leucine and tryptophan also um, restrict, uh, when restricted, increase lifespan. So I think more work remains to be done there. Um, but when we restrict either leucine or tryptophan or lysine, in our hands at least, these are associated with no or negative metabolic outcomes. And in work that we're gonna, uh, is forthcoming, we'll show that histidine restriction has improvements in metabolic health, um, as well as I showed you today, valine has some benefits. Phenylalanine restriction, threonine restriction um, have been shown by us as well as Adam Rose's lab um, to be associated with improved metabolic health in mice. And I'd like to thank all the people who were involved in this. Um, uh, Michaela Murphy and Kara Green are the ones currently working on isoleucine in the lab. Nicole Richardson, Cheryl Yu um, relate to our previous branch amino acid restriction work and identifying isoleucine as key um, intermediate. Um, and of course, all of our funders and uh, collaborators. And if you're interested in doing a postdoc in our lab, please come talk to me. Thank you so much, uh, Dudley. Uh, we have time for uh, a few uh, questions. We have one down here. So what happens if you restrict both isoleucine and methionine? So would it have an additive effect on lifespan and metabolic health? That is a very interesting question, and I think I, um, more broadly, I think there's a big good question about which combinations of amino acid restriction would have benefits, and also how much of what we identify is not just caused by rest absolute restriction, but by changes in ratios of amino acids. So we don't know that yet, but I think there's a lot of wor interesting work to be done there. I wonder whether um, uh, amino acid sensing mechanisms could play a role in the response that you get on metabolism. We've done some work in terms of looking at the role of mTOR sensing as well as GCN2. Um, the results are a bit counterintuitive. Certainly hepatic um, sensors do not seem to be involved in the response. Um, FGF21 as a nutrient um, 
responsive hormone does seem to be involved in some of the elements of the response to isoleucine. And that's something that we're investigating. And we're also taking unbiased approaches using uh, genetic mapping to identify loci that contain genes or variants that might uh, regulate the responses. Uh, hello. So when we talk about uh, the, the low branched amino acid foods, I mean, I wonder, everybody wonder how you can just prepare food with them, I mean, because it's almost in every kind of meat, and fish, and turkey, and chicken, and beef, bacon, and beef. Uh, this is my first question. And second question, uh, recently we've, it's been published that trimethylglycine, which is a longevity drug, it activates the, 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 the pathways and also it, by giving a methyl donor, uh, it will decrease the effect of uh, branch chain amino acid. Can you enlighten us, please? Thank you very much. Anybody who wants to uh, help fund the isoleucine restricted diets, please come talk to me. But um, in the meantime, um, while these custom foods uh, await preparation, um, the meats that are lowest in branched chain amino acids, and this independently comes from both weightlifting body sites and the USDA food database, um, is turkey and probably emu. Um, so emu is available in Wisconsin, an excellent reason to come, uh, come visit us. Um, and of course, turkey is probably available um, most places. Just a, cool, uh, a quick question. So Shingo Kajimura's group has shown the branch chain amino acids being having important role in uncoupling in the issue. Did you see some of those responses in your restriction studies as far as aging is concerned? There's definitely some interesting things going on in adipose tissue biology and what the branched amino acids are doing in that regard. Um, and that's something that we're looking into further. Hi, I was allowed a quick question. I was wondering, like, how would you design an experiment that would uh, like, find what accounts for the uh, like low response in female mice and uh, like such high response in male mice? That's a very interesting question, and I mean, one of the problems in doing that is um, that, you know, the sort of most obvious effect in terms of a gonadectomy is confounded by the fact that um, if you do that, then the female mice will have a huge increase in obesity right away. Um, so instead, we, this is one of the reasons that we've been sort of taking a strain and sex uh, dependent effect. So basically, if you look across strains and sexes, um, what we find is that while black six, my, black six males have a very strong response, black six females have a sort of intermediate response, het three males have a very strong response, het three females sort of intermediate or zero response to some various things. But DBAs, it's actually flipped, where the females respond better than the males. And so um, using genetic approaches to try and identify what the loci are, we're hoping to help explain why um, there is a sex dimorphism. Very nice. Thank you so much, Dudley. Fantastic talk. <laughs> and we will move on to the final speaker, Matt Cableine, uh, who will be exploring the dark matter of uh, aging biology. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so I want to thank Morton and, and all the organizers for uh, inviting me back to uh, ARDD. It is um, it's just an, an awesome meeting, and hopefully what I'm about to do doesn't mean it's the last time I'm allowed to come to Copenhagen, because I'm going to go completely off script and not talk about rapamycin. I'm sure at least some people in this room are very glad to hear that they don't have to hear Matt talk about rapamycin again. Um, <laughs> But in case you wanted to see the talk that I would have given, I did actually put this on YouTube. You can just search the title, you can find it. And that talk is actually about 35 minutes, so you don't have to see Martin try to bodily remove me from the stage if I had, had tried to give that talk. Um, instead, what I am gonna talk about is uh, something different. Uh, and, and the idea of, of uh, maybe looking at things that we haven't looked at before. And I apologize a little bit for the, uh, the 1980s looking sci-fi theme, but I kind of think it looks cool. Um, and this really stems from, in some ways, this is a little bit of a continuation of what I talked about last year at ARDD, which is that in many ways, I feel like um, the geroscience field, while there have been just amazing discoveries, has also narrowed quite a bit from when I came into this field as a graduate student. At that time, people were doing lots of unbiased genetic screens and discovering all sorts of stuff. And it seems to me that today, almost nobody is doing unbiased screens. And Gordon kind of alluded to this in, in his talk this morning as well. And I think we should really think about that and what we might be missing. And, and I would, whoops, whoa. 
Oh yeah, that's right. I do need to tell you guys that I have some uh, competing interests now. So I've been in this field for 20 years. It seemed like everybody else had a company or two or 10. Um, so I figured I should join the club. So as some of you know, I'm a founder and chief science officer at uh, a startup called Optispan GeroScience. I'm also a founder and, and chair of the board of directors for Aura Biomedical, which I'll tell you about today. Optispan is actually an investor in Aura. I'm also on the SAB and Optispan as an investor in a company called Trivium Vet. I'm not going to talk about Trivium today, but if you watch that video on rapamycin that I mentioned, Trivium has developed a proprietary formulation of rapamycin for veterinary use. It's actually the formulation that we're using in our rapamycin trial for the dog aging project, and they're also moving that into to human use. Um, so I wanted to mention those conflicts. Um, okay, so the idea here, I would say, is that we, I think we really have explored a teeny tiny fraction of the intervention space that's out there. All of the things that we know, everything almost that's been talked about at this, this meeting, comes from a tiny fraction of what is out there that we could look at for interventions that could impact lifespan and health span. And I would argue that, you know, there's a lot to be found uh, still under the surface. And in fact, I tweeted not very long ago that, that I would say basic geroscience re research has explored only a tiny fraction of the to total longevity intervention space. I put a number on it, which then somebody promptly took issue with the fact that the intervention space is infinite, which is true, but I figured having a small number was a useful way to think about it. Um, and I think more importantly, I believe that there are likely to be really large effect interventions out there that will be much greater than the things that we know about, like caloric restriction, like rapamycin. Um, and so I think there, there's a real opportunity there for whoever finds those things. Um, so how do we go about doing that? And what I want to do today is talk about two short stories, just to give you examples, not so much what the interventions are, but examples of unexplored areas where I think there are clear opportunities, not only to find new interventions, but to learn important things about the biology of aging, potentially. So the first one I want to talk about has to do with overexpression of essential genes. And this is a collaboration with um, Alateen Kaya at VCU. Alateen's here uh, in the audience, but I would say all the nice things about him that I'm about to say, even if he wasn't here. Now, I mean, Alateen, honestly, in my view, is is just a brilliant uh, uh, early career investigator. He's constantly coming up with amazing ideas. The things I'm going to tell you about in the next five minutes are really his. Um, not only that, but he's a great collaborator and a, and a great person. So I really feel happy to be able to, to call Alatina a friend and, and to work with him on this project. Um, so the idea here is if you think about almost all of the genetic uh, interventions that, that we, we know about, the ones particularly that have come from screens and invertebrates, those have almost exclusively been loss of function screens, deletion, collection in yeast, RNAi knockdown in, in worms and flies. We know very little about overexpression effects on lifespan. And secondly, they're almost exclusively in non-essential genes. And that, of course, is because if you delete an essential gene, by definition, you get a dead cell or a dead animal. And even when you knock down essential genes, most of the time, that's pretty detrimental because they're so important. There are a few exceptions in worms where people have done adult onset RNAi for essential genes. Sorry, didn't realize I was going through my slides. Um, but by and large, we have ignored essential genes. And they're really important, right? They wouldn't be essential if they weren't important. So Alateen had the idea that maybe we should look at overexpression of essential genes because there may be an opportunity there to find new things. Um, uh, this is done in yeast. It's the yeast replicative aging model. And uh, this is funded by a grant from the Impetus Grants Foundation. So Alateen and I have tried for a couple of years to get NIH funding. So far, no luck. NIH reviewers, I'm looking at some of you don't like fishing expeditions for some reason, reasons, I would argue that you're not going to land the big one if you don't ever go fishing, but they've been kind of trained not to fund fishing expeditions. So Impetus Grants program fortunately stepped up and helped us um, be able to move this project forward. Um, so the idea here is, is, as I said, start with essential genes. There are about 1,000, 1,100 essential genes in yeast. Um, most of those are highly conserved, right? They're essential. They're shared in worms and humans. There are clear orthologs, and in those organisms, they're usually essential as well. Um, and so hopefully, this, if we find interesting things, this will give us an opportunity to immediately look for translational modifiers uh, uh, of aging that are highly conserved. So Alateen took advantage of a collection called the Moby Collection in yeast, which is a collection of plasmids, each of which carries one gene, 
under its own promoter, and it's a low-copy plasmid. And so Olatine transformed these into yeast strains, created a library of about 1,000 yeast strains, each of which is expressing a single essential gene, overexpressing it at low copy. That's probably important because we don't want to induce toxicity. And I think being under its own promoter is probably important because these things are regulated by cell cycle or nutrient availability. And so we want to overexpress them within the context of how they normally function. Um, and so then, uh, both in Alatine's lab and my lab, we decided to, to do a, a pilot study, and I say it's a pilot. We looked at 92 of these things, and I don't know how many of you know how you do the replicative aging assay in yeast, but it involves people sitting in a microscope and manually dissecting daughter cells away from mother cells until they stop dividing. So it's actually a lot of work to test 92 strains um, for effects on lifespan. But here's the outcome. Um, and so what's shown here, are each uh, bar is a different strain, and this, what's shown is the effect on lifespan of overexpression of a single essential gene uh, relative to the empty vector control, so the plasmid with no gene in it. And hopefully what you can immediately appreciate is a lot of them are long-lived. That's the green, the, the LL, so that's the percent effect on lifespan. Um, I can tell you from having worked with Brian Kennedy and others on a screen of more than 5,000 single gene deletions in yeast, the longest lived strains here are longer lived than almost all of those, maybe all of them. They're close to the longest lived deletion uh, or longest lived mutants that have ever been identified in yeast. Those are usually double mutants or triple mutants. Um, and probably more importantly, the hit rate for deletions for lifespan extension is about 3%. This looks like it's more like 30%. God dang it, I'm not even touching that thing. Um, maybe I'll just put it down until I'm ready to use it. Okay, um, so it's pretty amazing, right, to get a, at least it looks like an order of magnitude enrichment in the frequency of lifespan extension by overexpressing essential genes compared to what we would expect from deleting non-essential genes. Um, of course, they're, they don't all extend lifespan. The blues are what we call ambiguous. The red are short-lived, so some things are detrimental when you overexpress them. And this work um, has recently been published in GeroScience, if you're, if you're interested in looking into it. Alatine's lab did a, did a fair amount of, of omics and trying to map these to pathways. Some of them make sense, some of them are new, so that's pretty exciting. I think the most exciting thing, though, is that there are so many, right? From, from a screen of 92 genes, you know, maybe, maybe 30, certainly I would say at least 20 we validated look like they are genuinely long-lived and substantially long-lived compared to what we would expect. Um, we've done a little bit now of trying to move this into C. elegans. This is unpublished data. We've taken four of the, the original hits, overexpressed them under their own own promoters, sorry, it's under a constitutive promoter in C. elegans um, in this case. And in three of the four cases, it looks like there's a lifespan extension. So this is early, like I said, it's preliminary, but this is, I think, encouraging, right, that this may also be a, the case where a lot of the essential genes that extend lifespan when you overexpress them in worms also extend lifespan when you overexpress them in C. elegans. And as we heard from Gordon earlier today, there's a case that can be made that, at least for drugs, when you get lifespan extension in C. elegans, that tends to work in mice. So hopefully, this will give us uh, new targets to go after that are translationally relevant, or at least evolutionarily conserved. Okay, so uh, that's the end of this part of the talk. And again, I just want to summarize. Um, I think the big deal here is how often we got lifespan extension. And I think that this might tell us something fundamentally important about the biology of aging that we didn't know about before, right? That, that for some reason that we don't understand, essential genes are really important. And they, tend to be, they might tend to be limiting for longevity, at least in yeast, maybe in worms, and maybe all the way up to, to people. And so, I would say we probably ought to study that. I would say this is interesting enough that this is worth studying further, and hopefully we can get NIH reviewers to agree with us at some point. Um, okay, so then I'll switch gears, and I'm going to talk now about pharmacological uh, uh, screens. And obviously, the, the, the number of small molecules that have been studied for effects on aging and lifespan in any organism is, is tiny, right? It's a tiny, tiny fraction of the, the, the uh, small molecule intervention space. So um, one of the things that I'm very interested in are combinations of small molecules and how those might affect lifespan. And can we do better than we can do with individual molecules? And we know about a few cases, but really, again, only a very small number have ever been tested in combination. And I would say in order to really do this well, we need true high throughput, true unbiased approaches 
to really be able to explore any significant fraction of the intervention space. Um, and so in my lab, we've developed a system that I think accomplishes this. So this is, I showed at the, uh, the ARDD meeting last year, that talk is also on YouTube if you wanna go learn more about the Wormbot. So this is a robotic system that we use for high throughput uh, lifespan studies in C. elegans. And what you're looking at here is a robot that moves a webcam over individual wells of 12 well plates. And each of those wells is about 30 individual C. elegans animals. So we get a still image every 10 minutes of every animal on that device over its entire lifespan, okay? And then we can compile those images into a video and we can use a neural network to tell us where the worms are in each image. And we've got software now that will tell us when the worms um, die, okay? And I'll show you a little bit of that data. And it really is pretty much a set it and forget it system for us at this point, it works pretty well. So I just estimated last year that if we had a, a dedicated worm bot and we kept it going 24 seven for a year, we could do about 2,500 intervention experiments. And I proposed, why don't we build 40 of these things and do 100,000 intervention experiments a year? And the nice thing about this system is that I think it's essentially infinitely scalable. So there isn't really any bottleneck to scaling this as much as you want. So what could you do if you could do 100,000 experiments a year? You could do a lot, right? You could think of all sorts of different things you might want to look at. Um, so I have yet to convince, again, any NIH uh, reviewer to fund the Wormbot project. And so instead of fighting anymore, I decided, well, let's try and spin out a company and see if we can do it in the for-profit world. And so we have started Aura Biomedical from my lab. Um, Mitchell Lee is the CEO of the company. Ben Blue, who developed the neural network and the software for doing the analysis, is the CTO. Um, as I mentioned, I'm uh, on the board. Brian Kennedy and Jan Gruber, who many of you know probably are also co-founders. Uh, and then Jason Pitt is the uh, person who developed the Wormbot, and he's also a, a co-founder. And the, the rest of the guys like this tagline, building the future of preventative medicine. I tried to go with building an army of robots to defeat aging, but they <laughs> overruled me. I still like this one better. Um, so what we've done, um, and I'm not gonna show you a ton of data, but I'm gonna give you a hint, I think, of, of what is possible. So as sort of a proof of principle, we decided to dedicate one worm bot, and actually it's a, it, it's a half a worm bot, it's what we call a mini because it, it's half the size of a regular worm bot and it fits in an incubator, to devote half a worm bot to doing a drug screen. And this is an FDA approved library. We're using that A beta model that Gordon talked about um, because it, we think it's a really nice model of proteotoxicity and so far the things that work in that model work for normal aging. We can just do more, more quickly in this model. Um, and a little bit of a twist here is we wanted this to be a proof of principle combinatorial screen. So we have four conditions for every, everything we test. One is the control, so the vehicle control. One is metformin alone, because metformin works consistently, at least for us in worms. Um, one is the FDA approved drug alone, and then we do a combination. And these are all done in dupl duplicate wells for the first pass, and then we've gone on and validated several of these using additional um, runs on the, on the robot. So this is just a, uh, a snapshot of the data. I think there are like 60 or 70 compounds that we've tested here. Um, just to kind of give you a feel for what we're seeing. So again, um, each set of three bars is a compound, an FDA approved drug. Um, the, uh, and it's showing the, the change from vehicle control, okay? So, the, and it's ranked by the FDA approved drug alone's effect. So on the left side are drugs that shortened lifespan, on the right side are drugs that extended lifespan in, in blue. Okay, the, um, the drug that's farthest to the left is kind of interesting, it's kind of funny. This is a drug I'm sure you all have heard of. It's been in the news in the last couple of years. Anybody want to guess? Ah, somebody said it, ivermectin, yes. It's an anti-helminthic, just happened to be in the first set of drugs we tested. Um, and it shortens lifespan in a worm, so that's great. It's worth doing what it's supposed to. Um, uh, so that was actually a nice confirmation for us and we got a good laugh out of it. But you'll notice there's other things that are interesting here. There are quite a few drugs that are extending lifespan on their own. Metformin is the red, so that's nice. It's consistent, right? You always get about a 15 or 20 percent effect. And then you'll see some of these interesting green ones, which is the combination, where you get effects that are different from either, either drug alone, like 
down, I think it's the third from the end, the effect of the combination is much bigger than either the drug alone or metformin alone. So this looks like true synergy, which is, I think, pretty cool, and we have a few of those. Um, so I'm going to show you a video now. What you're going to see, this is now the, the time-lapse images off the worm bot compiled into a movie. So you'll start seeing those worms move around when I click the button. And then as the neural network and the software detect that they're dead, um, a red circle will pop up around them, and the survival curve will fill at the same time. Don't hit me. I'm almost done, I promise. Okay. This is, a, this is an eight-minute video, so, you know, no. <laughs> So you can see the worms moving. Look, now the controls are starting to die. You can see that in the graph. The metformin will follow in just a minute. And the drug alone will follow as well. And then there's the combination. And you can see the worms are still moving on that plate when the others are pretty much all dead. This is, I think, one of the things I really like about the worm bot. You can go back and look at the data, right? And nobody touched this. This is just the robot doing its job. So I think in terms of rigor and reproducibility, there's some, some value here as well. So anyways, it, it looks like a pretty synergistic effect. This is the, the graph of three of the compounds that have given a synergistic effect, um, or what we would call a synergistic effect. Some of them are pretty big, like that one that I just showed you is about, yeah, I'm sure you did, uh, about two and a half times the, uh, the control, right? So 250% effect. So that's a pretty big effect, certainly bigger than most of the stuff that we talk about. So I'm pretty excited to see where this goes, and I think we have an opportunity to, to really identify some cool stuff. Nice thing is, because these are FDA-approved drugs, we know something about what they do. And in fact, that third one, we know exactly what the biochemical mechanism is. So there are other sort of downstream um, studies that can be done as well to, to tease that out. So I just want to finish up by saying that's two examples of many, I think. I know it's, it's kind of corny, but um, it's two examples, I think, of places that we can look where there's stuff to be found. And I'm sure there's tons of smart people in this room, right? You guys can think of other places to look that are new and unexplored, and I would encourage you to at least think about it because I think there's a lot that we still have to learn about the biology of aging outside of the hallmarks or the pillars. Sorry, Felipe, but, um, but I really believe that. So that, that's the message I want to leave you with is to, to go for it. All right, thanks. Do we have time, or should I leave, leave no. with my head down? Get out! No, no. <laughs> that was a really fantastic, Matt. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, I think. Uh, maybe I can start. So for these drugs, these are FDA-approved drugs. How do you know that it's an on-target or an off-target effect? I don't. And, and to some extent, I don't care at this point. I mean, I guess this is where, you know, speaking as an academic, I don't care, right? I mean, I, part of me says what we need to do is explore. Right? And so the only way to, in my view, the best way to explore is to be completely unbiased. And then I think in the case of the FDA approved drugs, we will know something about why they were approved. And then you can go forward and do experiments to test whether it's targeted. So like in the case of the one that I mentioned, we know what the biochemical target is. There are mutants in that target that are null in worms and we can do the, the epistasis experiment and see if the effect requires the target. And so it makes sense. It makes sense in that okay. case. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. So very cool talk. Um, I mean, regarding the second point, like the second approach, um, do you have any other idea that uh, you can actually uh, even expand this robot to test something not not go through the oral administration? So if I understood the question correctly, you're asking if we could test something that doesn't go in through the, the, the mouth? Yeah, exactly. So I think this is completely agnostic to route of entry. So there, if there was something that did that, we would be able to detect it. I think the, what you're asking is a different question, which is, I think, are there technologies that we could use or tools we could use to allow drug delivery that wouldn't require going through the mouth? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, because, uh, I mean, because uh, still have uh, some kind of like a bias that, that you only, yeah. I mean, take the drug can yeah. absorb why the intestine. Yeah, intestine. so I mean, people have thought about this and there are strains that are, I don't know that there are really good strains about for uptake. There are strains that are less effective at pumping the drugs out. I, and I think those are, those are things that we have considered and, and may implement. Again, for this first proof of principle, I'm willing to tolerate false negatives. I br expect that we will miss things as long as we're getting some good positives. So that was sort of my rationale for, for that. The other thing I'll just add is this is not limited to lifespan. So we also get daily movies. We can do health span. And there, I think there are other things in worms, behavioral assays, sensory assays that are also easily adaptable to this system that we haven't done it, but I think others probably could. Quick question. Uh, 
that was a great presentation. Um, Thank you. Talking about the first point that you made around overexpression, there were a bunch of genes that were also underexpressed, and I know these are essential genes. Uh, but what do you, what are your thoughts about regulated underexpression of these genes? Uh, do you think that those might be potential methods of, uh, you know? Uh, targeting. Yeah. So, I, if I understand what you're correct, you're asking me correctly. You're asking, is that another, is that another way to explore what we haven't explored before, which is to regulate the, the level of expression and when they're underexpressed? Absolutely. No, I think that's that absolutely. There's, there's again, sort of infinite ground there. Um, you know, my approach is to try the simple things first, and this was this was easy compared to what you suggest. But yeah, definitely, there's a lot to be done there. All right, thank you so much, man. Right. Thank that you. was amazing. And thanks for not hitting me. Um, and uh, we have uh, dinner served now. Uh, we'll be back at uh, 7. The speakers, Matt, Dudley, Vishwa, can you go to the uh, sponsor wall up there? And there will be uh, someone asking you a few questions.